Good afternoon, everyone. I was going to start this session by uh, by telling you all that you're you're very lucky people, uh, but in fact, I realise that's the wrong thing to address you with. You're very clever people, <laughs> and you're very clever people to come and listen to uh, Fintan O'Toole. Now, Fintan, I hope you won't mind me saying this, is not quite as well known in Central Europe as he is in the Anglo-American uh, sphere, the English language uh, areas. Um, but there he's an absolute uh, megastar. Um, <laughs> so his most recent book, We Don't Know Ourselves, which is a, a memoir that weaves in the history of, of Ireland since he was born in 1958, was last year selected as one of the five best non-fiction books published in the United States by the New York Times. Uh, and uh, he's written so many books that I, I mean, it's, there's no point going through them all at the, uh, at the moment. But the point is, is, is that every book that he writes um, gets stellar reviews, but this is a, a particularly mesmerizing and compelling piece of, of writing about Irish history and about Fintan, Fintan himself. So Fintan has worked uh, for many years for the Irish Times, but he's also, I see you were a television journalist at one point and won. I was a very bad one, yeah. yeah. Uh, although you managed <laughs> to win Journalist of the Year award, I noticed, for being a bad television journalist. And, uh, but he's also worked a lot in the United States. You can read him regularly in the New York Review of Books. And for about 10 years, he was the drama critic of the New York Daily News. And for many, many years, he has been teaching at uh, Princeton uh, every year. He also uh, is a regular guest at Cambridge uh, University. And um, so it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. Um, but today we're going to talk a bit about Ireland, a bit about America, and a bit about Britain uh, as well, but Fintan, I want to start because you you cross disciplines from uh, politics to literature and art, theatre, obviously. I was thinking this morning about, well, let me name a few other Irish authors to start with. And I started with Swift. You could probably go back earlier than that. And then there was Goldsmith, and then there was Sheridan, and then there was um, uh, Lawrence Stern, and then you get to the end of the 19th century and suddenly you have an avalanche of incredibly well-known authors from Oscar Wilde, not one so well-known as Bram Stoker, who, of course, generated a billion-dollar industry that, that works today when authoring Dracula. Uh, I still wonder, maybe you'll have an answer, why he chose Whitby in Yorkshire for a place to, <laughs> for Dracula to arrive in England. I've never understood that bit. Um, but then all of a sudden you have Yeats, you have, you have Shaw, James Joyce comes in, later on you've got Beckett, I'm missing lots of people out here. Now the reason why I mention this, Finton, is not because you have uh, a lot of great authors. Up to this, up to this day, uh, we were just discussing just now, you said that you opened the New York Times a book review every weekend, and there's another novel by an Irish novelist which is being praised to the hilt and so on. But what's really important about these writers is not just that there are so many of them and they're so well known, but they often completely change the face of literature. So, I mean, just to, to pick Joyce and Beckett, for e example, but there are, are many, many more. Now, if you were to compare the same population of Ireland in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, with somewhere in England, say, it would be maybe Newcastle and Birmingham amalgamated, right? And there were some good novelists that came out of the north of England, there's no question ab about that. But there is nothing to compare with what Ireland produces from the late 19th century onwards in terms of genre-busting 
uh, uh, and innovative writers. And so I wanted to start at this point with you as an Irish writer who knows this terrain very well. Why does Ireland have so many uh, innovative and uh, landmark authors from the late 19th century onwards? Um, it's a great question. And, uh Thank you all for being here. It's such a such an honor to be in this wonderful city and such a pleasure to be with Misha, whom I've admired very deeply for, for so long. Um, I suppose one way of thinking about it is that um, uh, good literature comes out of problems. Uh, you know, I was, I was listening to the, the, the wonderful uh, Juan Gabriel Vasquez yesterday and, you know, his relationship to Colombia, for example, um, comes out of the, the unsettlement of that place. And Ireland uh, is sort of perennially unsettled. Uh, it's, 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 um, you know, it's, it, it looks, if you look on the map, it's bounded, it's an island, it seems very easy to pin down and define. Um, but it's, it's, its history has been one of uh, linguistic shift, for example. So um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting place where in the middle of the 19th century, the majority of the population spoke Irish, you know, a language which has no relationship to English whatsoever, um, and a very, very old literature. Um, uh, you know, the, the oldest uh, non-classical European literature um, is, it was, it was in the Irish language. And then that language um, collapsed, really, in, in, in the 19th century, but inflected and infused the way Irish people see English and think about English, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and talk English and speak English. Yeah. So um, I think if you have that kind of language shift, there's an awareness of language as an unnatural thing. <laughs> you, know? you, you, you think about it as something that you can play with and that, you know, is, 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 is also problematic. You know? um, and one of the things that Irish writers always do is make it difficult to express themselves, you know. Um, they're always creating stylistic problems or problems of narrative, you know. They're, they're just, they don't like it when it's too easy. <laughs> and that actually does produce interesting literature. Um, I think also uh, then the relation to the English language is, 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 uh, is complicated by mass migration. Uh, so it's also has been a diaspora culture um, for a long, long time. Um, when I was born, there were only 2.8 million people left in the Republic of Ireland. In 1840, there were six and a half million people in that area. You know, there's nothing quite like that where the population has gone everywhere. And I think that also produces a certain kind of self-awareness, you know, where, where what does it mean to be Irish in this, in this very fractured kind of context? Uh, uh, but also it means that you're kind of feeding in everything. Um, the Irish can play with everything. They can play with Britain, of course, which they do. You know, there's that long tradition from Swift, as you say. It's a satiric tradition. It's a subversive tradition. Um, Shaw, Wilde, all that, you know, is very much there. A kind of comic subversion of Englishness is, is one of the things they can do. But also, it's very alive and alert to America, um, simply because of the, the vast numbers, you know. I mean, you, you still have an American president, for example, who um, I remember on the day after he was, uh, he was elected, the BBC were trying to to, um, to buttonhole him, you know, and he said, who are you? And he said, uh, we're from the BBC. He said, BBC, I'm Irish. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. I mean, it was kind of insane, but there's still that kind of weird sense of, of Irishness as a sort of identity that's out there somewhere. And I, I think all of this kind of stew feeds into the fact that um, you can do anything you like with being Irish in a way. You can, you can sort of play with it in all sorts of ways. And then um, more recently, you've had two things you've had uh, I mean, I would say if you wanted to have a formula for how do you produce a lot of very good novelists, uh, you, you need the right mix of good country, bad country. Uh, good country is that Ireland actually invests quite a lot of money in the arts and, and in literature, and that does make a difference. There's no huge mystery about this. If you support people, if you give them a context, if you give them encouragement, uh, it works, you know. Um, and uh, Irish writers now stay in Ireland, by and large, because they don't pay much tax on their earnings. 
there's lots of very good magazines and you know there's an infrastructure where the people can publish young writers can publish so Sally Rooney for example who would be the biggest commercial success I suppose from from Irish writing in recent years you know was, was publishing in those small magazines when she was 22 23 uh, you know and they're very good and they're serious and they're and you know that that's that's important uh, so you have that good thing and then you have the bad. You need a lot of bad. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of that. So Irish writers are still um, really only catching up with the traumas of the Northern Ireland Troubles, for example. Um, I don't know if this is true in general, but I suspect it is that writers don't really... Novelists are not very good at writing very contemporary reflections on the violence and trauma that's going on right now. It maybe takes a generation before you can, can really do that, and, and that's certainly happening. So some of the best writings coming out of, uh, out of Ireland now, the, the island you know, is sort of set in the 80s, 90s in, in Belfast or in Derry. I don't know if people know Anna Byrne's novel, Milkman, for example, which I think mm. is, a, is a great, great novel. Um, th that would be an example of that. And then also in the Republic, you have the backwash of theocracy. So, I grew up in a country which was very theocratic. I mean, it was a Catholic state dominated by the Catholic Church with all of the institutional repression and, and terror that that involved. Um, you know, we had institutions where women were locked away, children were locked away, um, people who were not um, good Catholics, you know, were, were a, a disgrace on society were locked away. And so writers now are, those stories were silenced you know, and, and all that silence is now feeding into a way of finding expression. Uh, so you, you've got somehow the, this mix of very good infrastructural circumstances and, and, and a lot of a lot of material stuff still to deal with. Yeah, yeah. a <laughs> yeah. lot of material not being to, processed. to work with. Yeah. I, I'm also interested. I'm going to come back uh, at some point to that that change in Irish society that sort of mirrors the trajectory of your own life in a way. But, but first of all, the other thing which I've, I think is interesting, you, you, you mention it with that shift in language, is, is that this is a culture which has been, although it's an island, as you mention, it's been living with borders. Yeah. It's in a liminal state the whole time. Yeah. Because, of course, one thing that you've pointed out in your writings of Brexit, which people in England don't really realize, is that Ireland was the first colony. And since then, that relationship with Britain has been absolutely critical in forming Irish culture. Yes, yes. Y you know, um, English is my native language. I grew up with... Shakespeare and Milton and Spencer and, and all of that and uh, as you know anybody who's reading in Ireland is is, is plugged into the history of, of English literature but also then kind of aware that um, if you're reading Shakespeare you come across a lot of anti-Irish jokes you know I mean his view of the Irish is there you know there's, it's just bogland with savage people in it and um, the first but it's really interesting the first Irish character we have in English theatre of you know of any kind of major standing is in Henry V Shakespeare's play Henry V and I'm not making this up you would think you were kind of making it up as an academic point but the, the opening line of the Irish character is what is my nation what is my nation, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and Shakespeare does it with an Irish accent. He does I-S-H, ish, wash, ish, my nation, you know? It's a, <laughs> it's a, uh, but but it, it somehow, you know, he, he gets this thing that this is a, a problematic identity. In this play, Henry V, he's trying to say, you know, this is great Britishness. This is the formation of a British identity. And you have this kind of, weird Irish character who doesn't fit in and then sort of, you know, speaks various lines and then just disappears because you don't know what to do with them. So it, it, exactly as you say, you know, we have this, this very long relationship with Britain. Uh, Ireland's very much formed by that relationship and, 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 and can't get away from it and doesn't want to get away from it in a sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a part of who we are as part of our, part of our reality. Um, the, the really sad thing for me is that uh, in 2011, um, it was possible for the first time in 100 years for the reigning British head of state, Queen Elizabeth, as she was then, uh, to visit Ireland, well, to visit the Republic of Ireland. The previous visit by a British monarch to Dublin was in 1911. It was exactly 100 years. And it just could not have been possible for that to happen. And it happened in 2011, 
and I, I'm very anti-monarchist and all, but it was a very moving event because it really was a sense of reconciliation. There were 200 people out on the street protesting, you know, it, and, and you just felt, oh God, it's over. You know, all this hundreds and hundreds of years of angst and, and, and bitterness and all that complication, it's over now, you know, we, we're just neighbors and it's fine. And it really did feel like that the Irish governments, British governments had worked so closely together on the Northern Ireland peace process. They, they were very careful to make sure that there wasn't a cigarette paper between them in terms of their public utterances throughout all that period. And then you get Brexit, which is just like this eruption um, which, which tears all that up, you know, and, and just was so careless about the effects on Ireland and the, and the Irish border and all that stuff which we won't bore people with because it became very boring. But, you know, there was just a sense that this, this shock of a, a complete lack of knowledge, a complete lack of interest, a complete lack of any sense of responsibility to what after all is supposed to be part of the United Kingdom, Nor Northern Ireland, you know. And, and I think that was a shock, you know, it, 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 it made you think actually, Maybe we're getting over this stuff, but there are a lot of people in England who haven't got over the, the condescension and the ignorance and the sense that actually Ireland is just a game you can play for the benefit of a certain kind of English politics. But this was also, <coughs> this was uh, a mature island politically and a very different island politically you're talking about in 2011 and 2016 because, as you mentioned it, it was, as you were growing up, a theocratic state. And for those of us in England who knew anything about Ireland and the uh, uh, ignorance uh, in England and even in parts of Scotland and Wales as well about Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is astonishing in the 60s, 70s and beyond, even to this day. I mean, it was very evident in Brexit. But if you did know a bit about it, you saw Ireland as a place that was kind of fun to visit, but my God, you wouldn't want to live there because the, the, the oppressive influence of the church was absolutely uh, everywhere. Now, in 10 years or so, this seemingly unbreakable edifice collapsed yeah. and turned Ireland upside down. How did it happen just like that? Yeah. No, I, I mean, you lived through it, you've written yeah. about it. It's I mean, I, I feel very much like an anomalous person because uh, I, I've had the privilege of living in a country where, by and large, political developments have been positive. You know? <laughs> it's actually been a, a story of kind of liberation and of, of um, opening up and of tolerance, um, you know, a sort of general shift of the center ground to the left rather than to the right. Um, and it happened because we tried everything else. You know, it's, it's not that the Irish are wiser than anybody else, it's just we, 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 we did everything else wrong <laughs> that you can possibly think of. And as I'm looking around the world, I, I, I see people who are offering a vision of the future, which is very like the Irish past. And you don't want to go there. You know, you really don't want a tribalized society like you had in Northern Ireland, sectarian conflict, um, which, which is still, you know, scouring that place. Uh, and you don't want what we got in, 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 in the Republic of Ireland, which is uh, identity politics writ large, you know. That, that our identity was not that we were going to be <coughs> a, a successful, prosperous country that could afford to educate its population and all that, you know. I mean, when I was born, Ireland was the worst educated population in Europe. And we're talking about the, the cultural productivity, the great writing, all those wonderful traditions. But, you know, the vast majority of people when I was born had only primary school education. They'd left uh, education at 14. Uh, there was no free second level education. You had to pay to go to second level education. Uh, uh, and this was because the church was quite happy, really, to have an ignorant population. <laughs> because it could, through mass emigration, export people who were not happy. Um, and through repression, it could control those who couldn't emigrate, particularly women and children. Um, so we had... Um, this uh, 
this idea of a, a friend of mine wrote a book called The Best Catholics in the World, you know, which is, a, is about this period too, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a summation of what we were supposed to be. So you compensate for, for poverty, for underdevelopment, uh, by saying, yeah, we may be poor, but look, we are spiritually, you know, the, the, the greatest place on earth. We're a beacon to the rest of the world. If only the rest of the world could be like us, everybody would be happy, you know. And, you, you know, even while you know that you're miserable, and even though you're, you know you're looking at the movies from America saying, we'd love to be like that, you know, we'd love to have fridges and cars and, you know, and live that kind of life. But but the, 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 the reality of it, you know, was, was um, as you say, very stultifying um, and also utterly hypocritical. And, and this is, again, where the writing came in. So one of the reasons why you've got such great writing from Ireland in that time is that the writers exploit the gap between the public and the private. I, I, Irish people are just like everybody else. They they're, they're want to lead their lives exactly the same way everybody else does, but they have to keep up this facade uh, of being holier than thou, literally. <laughs> and so there's a huge gap between these things. And, and it's, it's, it's novels, it's plays that fill that gap, you know, that actually uh, allow you to understand what the reality is. Um, but there was also an economic drive, wasn't there, that shifted this? Because as you yeah. say, it was incredibly poor, the place. Yeah. And uh, who, who, who is it who suddenly says, Wait a minute! We can turn this into yeah. into the Celtic tiger. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's a bit slower than that, of course, as it always is. But in the year I was born was 1958, and you had an extraordinary young civil servant um, who who had risen to the top of the Department of Finance, which was the most important uh, government department. He was only 38. A guy called uh, T.K. Whitaker, and Whitaker. Um, was looking at, um, I think he was looking, he saw the cover of a satirical magazine and the cover was a cartoon, I think, where there was a fortune teller uh, at one side of the table and a young woman who was Ireland at the, the other side of the table. And the young woman was saying, <clears throat> get to work. They're saying I have no future, <laughs> you know? And he, he looked at this and he thought, ah, that's just absolutely true. I mean, there is no future for this place. Um, it, it, it's tried this sort of, you know, uh, autarkic idea of, of being ourselves alone, you know, Sinn Féin, that was the political party that kind of uh, ran the Irish Revolution. Um, and so uh, Whittaker, with the support of a number of politicians, um, really forced through a change, which was to uh, open up Ireland to foreign investment. Uh, and, and this really starts in the 1960s. Um, and it, it, it sort of moves very slowly. Um, one of the interesting things they do is um, it's the opposite of um, the Stalinist five-year plans. You know, the, the Stalinist five-year plans, they would set impossible goals and then shoot people for not reaching them. Whereas the, in, the, in Ireland, they set the goals really low <laughs> because they thought, at least if we can reach the really low goals, we might feel good about ourselves and we, you know, we might start to get some confidence back. And so through the 1960s, 1970s, you do start to get increasing investment. Um, initially, a lot of it is German or British, or even Japanese, uh, but over time, it becomes American. And uh, particularly after Ireland joins the European Union in 1973, um, Ireland becomes an important place for European investment. Uh, so now you have, uh, if you think of the top 10 companies in the world in, three areas, information technology, medical technology, med medical devices, and pharmaceuticals. At least eight of the top 10 in, in those three areas will be, uh, have their European headquarters in Ireland. Uh, and and this, this, some of this was tax incentives, but also they began to realize that, as I said, Ireland was the worst educated population in, in, in Europe in 1958 when I was born. It's now the best educated population. 54% of the entire population has a third level degree, you know. Um, so uh, Michael that's an Sandel, extraordinary It is an extraordinary thing. number, yeah. I mean, Michael Sandel was talking last night very interestingly about, you know, education, educate, and do we overstate education? But in the Irish case, um, the confidence it gives a society which has been brutalized by bad education for so long, just to feel actually, you know what, our kids are really smart, and that attracts inward investment. It now attracts, of course, inward migration. I mean, for me, 
if, if somebody had told me, I mean, even 20 years ago, I mean, not that long ago, that um, Ireland would become a magnet for people in Europe looking for good work. <laughs> I, I would have just called in the men with the white coats, you know, it just would have seemed just completely insane. There was no inward migration when I was, you know, even up to the time I was 40. It was almost nothing. Now, 20% of people living in Ireland were born somewhere else, you know, which is a very high, high proportion. Including quite a lot of British people. Yeah. So we've had a lot of British exiles um, <laughs> who are exiles from uh, Brexit, and they're really welcome, you know. Um, a, a lot of the best British writers have, you know, decided to become Irish in their last years. Hilary Mantel, very sadly, I mean, Hilary had just bought, uh, bought her house in, in County Cork. She'd taken out Irish citizenship. You know, she has Irish roots. Almost everybody in Ireland, including you, of course. Yes, We've got you. I, I, so, uh, I, we should I'm say, we, we now claim Misha because... I'm your uh, compatriot <laughs> and uh, proud uh, of it. Uh, we're we're going to do a, a special postage stamp with Misha on it. You know, <laughs> they're welcome. But, but um, I, I, this really struck me. Um, John le Carre, the great English thriller writer, probably the most English writer you can think of, really, in a lot of ways, you know. Um, his son sent me the last photograph that he had taken of his father. Um, and uh, it's, it's a lovely photograph, you know, of Le Carre. He's sitting across the table, nice bottle of wine in front of him. Um, he's beaming and he's literally wrapped in the Irish flag, the Irish tricolor, you know, and it's, it's, it's a really strange photograph, but, um, it, it, and his son was telling me that this really meant a lot to him, you know, it wasn't just a kind of protest against Brexit, or because, he's, this is the truth, isn't it, of identity, that his mother left home when he was five, and this had a huge effect on him, and, and, and he never really knew his mother, and, and then thinking about his mother was Irish, and, and through this process of, you know, trying to establish that he could get Irish citizenship, he has to think about his mother and his grandmother and uh, where he comes from. Um, and, and, you know, all of this to me is it's just a wonderful demonstration of the openness and flexibility of identity. And God, if there is anybody that needs open and flexible identities, it's us, you know, because we know exactly what the opposite's like, you know. We, we know what it's like to live through this zero-sum game uh, of, of identity politics where you just get, you know, two tribes uh, who, who define themselves by not being the other one, you know. Um, and I, I suppose this process of economic change, this process of inward migration, uh, allows you to s not so much stop the us and them thing, but to start thinking about the us bit rather than the not them bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's why Ireland is generally quite a positive place to be. We'll, we'll come back to that tribal thing at, at the end because I want to finish off on, on Northern Ireland and Brexit. But before we do, you <laughs> followed the well-trodden path from Ireland to the United States, except your circumstances, it was a path of choice rather yeah. than a path yeah. of necessity and compulsion. Um, and as you, you, you mentioned, you know, the Irish identity in the United States was a problematic when it become, when it, when it started, uh, but has become, you know, a very powerful identity in the US, Joe Biden, uh, when he travelled recently to Ireland, spent about half an afternoon in Belfast, couldn't wait to get out, <laughs> and then spent literally three days partying in Ireland, as far as I could see. It was yeah. one big presidential jolly. Yeah. And, so, and this means that the world to people like Biden, of course, you now have a, a backlash amongst... Uh, Catholics of Irish heritage in the United States who are turning out to be in the vanguard of conservatism in the US, which is an interesting phenomenon. What did you find there when you arrived? What did you expect to find? And has the trajectory of the United States in the past 25, 30 years or so surprised you in terms of just how sinister some of it has become? You know, when I went there first, I mean, it was Obama's America, you know, and, and, and there was a, a real sense of optimism around it, you know, the, 
Um, Obama disappointed people in all sorts of ways, but it's still an extraordinary historic moment, and, and uh, he, he had real achievements, and, and um, there was a sense that this was the direction it was going in, really. You know, the, I think the Republican Party published what it called its post-mortem on that election, the second election, Obama's second election. And you thought, oh good, they're doing post-mortems, it means they know they're dead, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, gradually you realize that actually the, the and if, I don't know if you remember, but the, they published this big post-mortem, the official um, document Republicans published saying, we've got to change or we're dead. We've got to become more open, more liberal, more tolerant of people of color, and you know, stop all this very negative stuff. You know, and then a lot of billionaires said, "No, actually, there's another way of doing this, right? Which is, which is um, to be post-mortem. You know, to actually be a, a zombie democratic." force, you know, which is which you, you take the democratic life out of it, you take the optimism out of it, you take the sense of of uh, American promise out of it, and, and you turn it back. I mean, Trump didn't come from nowhere. I mean, remember, uh, the, the billionaire class in America was, was funding um, the, the wonderful American phrase, astroturf movements, you know, as they said, it's got fake grassroots, you know, the Tea Party, um, all of these movements who were uh, anti-government, anti-state, anti-tax, um, but also g gathering uh, sort of dog whistle stuff around Obama, um, you know, Trump, Trump doing the birther stuff, so Obama wasn't really born in America, he was really born in Kenya, and therefore he's an illegitimate president, you know. A lot of that stuff kind of g going on around. Brilliantly uh, documented in Jane Mayer's book, Dark Money, about how this was a, a long-term absolutely, program. Absolutely, uh, you know, it's, it's a serious business, and, and uh, so, yeah, w w one of the things you, 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 you were very struck by going from Europe to America is, is, um, is exactly that sense that you have very organized forces who are thinking long term, you know, and who are thinking strategically about how you change the political game. So the Republicans realized that they, they cannot really win in any long term way. Uh, through democratic elections, they, they lose them. You know, they, they lose the popular vote. Um, so you then have to become post-democratic. There is a logic to that, you know, which is you you gerrymander, you use the electoral college, this mad system, um, to say, well, it doesn't really matter if we don't win the popular vote because we can still you can still be president. Uh, and and ultimately, of course, you you attack the democratic process itself, which 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 it ends you up get Rupert doing. Murdoch on board. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you, you know, I, I was very struck by, by all of that and, and trying to make sense of it. Um, and, I mean, the other thing which is just, I mean, it's very, very obvious, but if you come from a small country like Ireland or Austria, you know, the, the scale of American politics um, means that you have no connection to it. You know, there, there is no real connection to national politics. Um, you know, I was very struck last night, you know, the, the president of Austria was there, you know, uh, and this would not be unusual in Ireland, you know, you, 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 you'll bump into the prime minister, you, you know, it's a, there's a sense of, of, of locality, of connection. Um, in the United States, I mean, you, you, you won't see your state representatives, never mind the, the, the national ones. And so what that means is that you get this exaggerated performativity, everything is second hand, you know, everything is about how it's, how it's presented. Uh, everybody's known this really for a long time, and particularly with, you know, the, the, the TV, but, but you could see that being just hyped up, of course, with, with social media, you know, and, and um, one of the things that's f fascinated me and appalled me, you know, is um, uh, the way in which uh, p politics has become completely aestheticized. You know, um, and this is spread. I mean, this is Boris Johnson was a fictional character. Uh, you know, uh, so, so much of the far right. You know, it's 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 entirely perf performative. It's it's knowing. Everything is in inverted commas. Um, and 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 of course, Trump does that brilliantly for his audience. They find him very funny. They find him very entertaining. Um, they, they, they enjoy the business of outrage. And, and, and so the, the worse he gets, the more fun it is. Uh, all of that going on. 
And you keep thinking of Val Walter Benjamin's famous warning in the 1930s that the aestheticization of politics is fascism. <laughs> you know, that that's what happens when politics becomes more and more like bad art. And and one of the things I was thinking about with this is that, you know, as a as an old drama critic, the, the Greeks, if you watch a Greek tragedy, right, one of one of the most basic things that happens in the structure of that is the relationship between revelation and reversal. Right? When something is revealed, Oedipus slept with his mother and killed his father. Right? Oedipus can no longer be king. You know, the, the, the revelation leads to a reversal of power. And one of the things that this new politics has broken, and you could really see this in America, but I think it's become more general, is that you can reveal anything and there is no reversal. Um, and for somebody, if you spent all your life in journalism, and I grew up idolizing Woodward and Bernstein, um, I did an event a couple of years ago with Woodward and Bernstein, you know, and I thought, wow, oh, I was like being with the Beatles or something, you know, I mean, uh, but, but you know, the, the, what they stand for is this, um, is really the, the great uh, democratic myth, which is, which is uh, the emperor's new clothes, you know, Hans Christian Andersen's story that, you know, we just say the emperor has no clothes and then everybody says, oh by God, he doesn't have any clothes, you know, and, and then the emperor has to run off, you know, uh, and now it's yeah, the emperor's stark naked and what are you going to do about it? So what? Isn't it funny? Isn't it, you know, isn't it amusing? Um, the, the more naked the, the, the emperor is, uh, in a way, the more that's mistaken for authenticity. So. Uh, one more question on, on the US, because time is flying by so quickly. How critical is this next presidential election going to be for the United States and for the rest of the world? Oh, it's, 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 it's almost unthinkably so. I mean, it's almost unbearably tense to think about how high the stakes are. Um, I mean, the, the one thing you can, you can give Trump is that he's, he's increasingly open about what he intends to do. Uh, you know, he's completely open about the fact that basically th this will be the last election. You know, he, the, the election, the electoral process is already under huge stress, um, being attacked. Uh, I heard a figure the other day that something like 20% of election officials have resigned in America, and people who actually run the elections on the ground because they're intimidated. They're scared. It's not worth us. They don't want to do it anymore. So, you know, the, the democratic process will be gone. Um, he said the other day that he's going to charge um, the television stations that don't like him with treason. He's going to go after them. CNN, you know, and, 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 and other, all those Comcast stations that are not sufficiently loyal. Um, he has said that Mark Milley, who was the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was just General. resigned, the general, um, should be charged with treason you know, for, for not supporting Trump. <laughs> um, uh, Milley, uh, I mean, uh, a good answer to this was uh, Milley, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I, I never thought I would end up looking for progressive inspiration from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of the American military. But Milley, uh, Milley in his retirement speech to graduates at, at West Point or somewhere the, the last week, made an extraordinary speech. And if you saw, he said, he says, them, you do not take your oath to a country you do not take your oath to an army. You do not take your oath to an ideology. You do not take your oath to a would-be dictator. You take your oath to a constitution. Uh, and the fact that the outgoing head of the American military feels it necessary to say to young uh, soldiers and sailors to remind them that their oath, the oath that they're taking is to a constitutional system, uh, I mean, tells you just, just how high the stakes are. Uh, and of course, we know what the consequences of Trump being elected would be for Ukraine. Uh, we, we know what it would be for the continuing attacks on the European Union and, 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 and the undermining of those institutions. Um, I, I'm still quite optimistic. Um, there will be two candidates in, in, in 2024. One will be Donald Trump and the other will be Donald Trump. You know, um, he's the best candidate for the Democrats, sadly. I kind of wish they had a better one. But uh, the one thing I know from Ireland is that um, the right winning on abortion is the worst thing can happen to them. 
So we, the far right, the American far right engineered a constitutional referendum in Ireland in 1983 to ban abortion forever and ever and put it into the constitution. And they won hands down in the Ireland of the time. Um, and it was the worst thing they could possibly have done because uh, abortion is a great issue for the right when they're against, you know, when it's in place and they're against it. When you actually have to own it and say, okay, what are we going to do now? You know, are we going to lock up the 14 year olds who's been, who's, who's been raped? And the logic of your ideology is, yes, actually, that's what we're going to do. Well, it scares the life out of women, you know, and, and you look at every single election that's been held since they overturned Roe versus Wade, and what has the issue really been at the core of that? It's been abortion rights, and women have come out in huge numbers to vote against the Republicans, and I think they will do so again. So it's interesting you say that about the, the right having a, a manageable and achievable goal and then, then it backfiring because that's really what happened with Brexit. England's yes. populists or Britain's populists uh, actually succeeded in their stated uh, desired goal which was to take Britain out of the European Union and ever since then they've been having to own this catastrophe. Yeah. Now the, 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 the most acute aspect of that catastrophe is in Northern Ireland, which few people in England even follow. I mean, they're, they're just unaware of, of what is going on there. But as you suggested earlier, it drove a coach and horses through the Good Friday uh, Agreement. And we now have a situation which I think in the midterm to long term is untenable, but you have on the island of Ireland, a population of loyalists whose raison d'etre, the union with England, uh, is under threat. And they're a very angry group of, of people. Yeah. So although people have tended to forget about Northern Ireland since the Troubles, since, you know, even since, since after Brexit, how serious a situation other people of Northern Ireland and indeed the Republic of Ireland facing as a consequence of what's happened? Uh, it, 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 it is indeed serious. Um, I, I should say I don't see a return to outward violence uh, on a large scale on the horizon. Um, but, but there is a really fundamental problem and you've, you've put it extremely well. Um, Brexit was a game being played by essentially English nationalism. Um, and it was a game that was about mobilizing self-pity. Um, self-pity is, in a way, the primary emotion of the reactionary right. <laughs> uh, feel sorry for yourself, um, especially if you're privileged. Um, and there was one place in the world that did not need another helping of self-pity, and that was Northern Ireland. You know, uh, so to like, you know, just add in, oh yeah, here's another dose of it, uh, and particularly for for unionists. So, so we we have this problem. Uh, I come from an Irish nationalist mentality background. That's where I grew up with, and my my you know I, my sentiments and emotions are shaped by that sort of long history of Irish nationalism. But you really don't want to have a minority on the island which, which is disenfranchised, which, which sees no future for itself, um, which, which really doesn't, doesn't have any sense of self-interest or leadership. And that's really what we've got. Bre Brexit was, um, uh, was a sort of um, a drug that uh, unionists in Northern Ireland could inhale that gave them the illusion of a sort of super Britishness for a little while. They didn't have to deal with the complexities of living in Northern Ireland with a Catholic population which thinks differently. Um, and, you know, there was a high, there was a sugar rush. Um, and they, they rode that uh, sugar rush all the way to self-destruction, right, which, which is, I mean, just at a simple level, I won't go into all the details, but, but it's very simply understood, right? Uh, they put their future in the hands of Boris Johnson. Right? You know, they said, "Who do we trust here?" You know, and it's, oh, Boris Johnson. You know, I mean, you know, uh, they could have phoned at least twenty women and said, "You know, does Boris keep his promises?" No, no, you know, uh, and th this this then leads to, on the one hand, you're almost tempted to have a kind of Schadenfreude, you know, to say, "Well, it's your own fault." You know, you put yourself in this situation. Because uh, what's happened now is they've been 
effectively detached from the rest of the United Kingdom. So, so Northern Ireland uh, has ended up in this liminal space where it's, 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 it's more or less still in the single markets and the customs union, while the rest of Britain has left them. And if you're a unionist, this ought to be, how did we get here? You know, we've detached ourselves from, uh, from, from Britain. There is now effectively customs posts between Britain and Northern Ireland. I mean, have, think of this. Is that, can you think of any other country, you know, supposedly a single entity where you've got customs borders um, it, uh, in the internal market? Uh, and so they've done this to themselves. Uh, and of course, the thing we know, and it's a, it's, it's a, a threat to democracy generally, is that um, people will do almost anything except admit they were wrong. You know, the, 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 there's something about the humiliation of having to say, oh dear, we really screwed up there, didn't we? You know, so with Brexit, as, as you know, I mean, the Labour Party in Britain, which is probably going to be the next government, cannot bring itself to say to potential voters, actually, that might have been a bit of a mistake in 2016, because, and maybe they're right, you know, but they just know that that's, that's you're, oh, you're telling me I'm stupid, are you? You know, and then that kind of produces all it's this Don't stuff. mention the war. Don't mention it. Don't mention it. And unionists cannot deal with the fact that they've, they've created this situation for themselves. They've actually done more to undermine the union through Brexit than the IRA through its hideous, vicious campaign of violence did over 30 years. Um, Fintan, I'm going to hand it over to the, to the audience, although I must say Fintan has written the best book on Brexit called Heroic Failure. It's absolutely, it's very funny as well. Um, but it's important, I mean, it's indicative that it took an Irishman to write the best book on Brexit. And that's because the last people in the world to understand that their empire has collapsed, remembering that Ireland was the first colony of, of England, the last people to understand that are the imperial centre itself. And if you want to see, as I say, really, if you want to have a really funny but penetrating analysis of how that happens, read Heroic Failure. It's a marvellous book. Um, questions from the floor. Sorry, I've been rabbiting on. Um, Kirsty. <laughs> Thank you, Fintan, that was fascinating. Um, you spoke about how Ireland had gone from being a, a country that, that sent migrants from its shores for hundreds of years to suddenly having this very large influx of, of immigration from uh, mainly from the rest of Europe, but from all over the world. Um, you know, given the tensions that, that mass migration has caused elsewhere in Europe, are, are there tensions emerging in Ireland? How, how is the system coping with, with the influx? Um, thank you, Kirsty. That's a great question. Um, so Ireland does not have a far-right party with any parliamentary representation so far. Uh, and I don't say this with any complacency because we would have said a few years ago about Spain, for example, Spain has no far-right party of any size and now you've got Vox, you know, and you've all that, so, so who, who the hell knows. But, but uh, it, it is very interesting, I think. Um, I think there are three reasons why uh, there are tensions, of course, there are problems of, of um, underdevelopment. Ireland's infrastructure is very underdeveloped for historical reasons. Um, I, I always keep saying that Ireland is overdeveloped and underdeveloped at the same time without ever having been developed, you know. So it has this hyper-capitalism with all these American corporations and all that stuff, and an infrastructure which is still 19th century in, in a lot of ways. And so there's huge problems around housing. Um, somebody was telling me about what you can rent a lovely apartment in Vienna for, and I was thinking, you know, I, I think I might send my children here, you know, because for what you'll get a beautiful apartment in Vienna for, I mean, you, you know, you, you might get a dog kennel in Dublin at the moment, you know, it's really terrible and it's really corrosive and that does produce all these um, resentments about lack of infrastructure, lack of housing, healthcare being oversubscribed, all those kinds of things. But to go from almost no migration to 20% of people um, coming from abroad without huge social tensions, I think, is a real achievement and I said there's probably three reasons. One is we were those people very recently. You know, and in, in some senses we still are. So 20% um, of people living in Ireland are from abroad. And a, 
close enough to 20% of Irish people live abroad. You know, we we still go places. We expect to do so, um, and, and we have a history of of understanding what it's like to be discriminated against, to be dehumanised, to be the dirty, irresponsible immigrants coming in who's going to ruin your society. We we were them. You know. Um, secondly. Um, the demographic story is very different in Ireland from a lot of other places, uh, which is that it's a story of demographic recovery. Um, as I said earlier, I don't think there's a parallel anywhere where the, the island of Ireland as a whole had eight and a half million people in 1840. Uh, it, even now, after all this period of growth, it has six and a half million. Um, so, um, th you know, it's hard to tell a story about this place is full up, <laughs> you know. It, it sort of feels like demographic recovery is an enormously positive um, thing and inward migration is, is part of that story. And, and, and the other aspect of this is that it's, it's, it's coincided um, largely, although we, we had a dreadful, dreadful banking crash and property crash in 2008, but by and large this inward migration has coincided with, with economic growth. And, and with a positive economic story, so unemployment is very low. Um, you know, it's 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 possible for uh, people to get decent jobs uh, in in the Irish economy. A lot of people who are who are coming in are um, are coming in to work for the multinationals. You know, the, 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 so uh, so the, 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 there's enough of sort of positive narratives, um, and, and so maybe those those three things at the moment act as as barriers against this. But I I, I wouldn't be complacent about it. Um, I'm going to take two questions now. Uh, Tessa there, and then I saw a blue shirt, which is all I can see. Um, so if we go d to uh, the front first, and then I think I literally can't see anything, I'm afraid to. Tessa. Well, thank you, uh, Finder, and also Misha, for this hugely entertaining <laughs> Sunday afternoon talk. <laughs> um, you were mentioning at the beginning a long list of uh, male uh, Irish authors, and then uh, you said that recently there is this. Uh, there are authors that can deal with the, the remains or the or the legacy of uh, the theocracy. And I was wondering if you talk about my currently favourite uh, female uh, Irish author, Claire Keegan, and small things like this, or if there are others that we should or I should read. And secondly, I wanted to ask you because I had a very um, good meeting with the social. Democrats of, the no of Northern Ireland recently in Westminster, they have taken their seats, but they said they were preparing now for unification with the South. And uh, we were all sitting there thinking like, mm, as far as we understand, the South is not very hot on actually having this unification with the North. So I wanted to ask you for your analysis on this. Yes. Thank you. And uh, then sorry. Uh, one more, we'll, we'll take one more question. Was I... Did you want to? Sorry, I thought. I'm yes. Okay. Can I ask a, a question? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, my name's Adrian, barrister from London, and ex runner for the London Irish Ex Athletics and Marathon Club in West London. Oh. Uh, first of all, about the borders, internal border within the same country, can I just remind you that? East and West Germany had an internal customs border between East and West Berlin. That's a, an example of a country where there was a, a customs border internally. And the second part of my question is linguistic populism. As Fenton wrote about in the Irish Times on the 6th of June 1996, Irish is now w one of the official languages of the European Union. Is that not a, a paradox considering the Welsh are more vociferous about the preservation of their own language? And the Scots themselves have a related form of Gaelic with Irish, but it's only the Irish that have managed to swing their language onto the European Union. Is that not a great success yes. for the Irish people? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for, 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 for those great points. Um, 
to test this point about um, about Claire Keegan, this wonderful, wonderful writer, um, I, I would just add, you know, my my uh, encouragement to read that beautiful little book, um, small things like these, um, which deals with the legacy of. Um, these horrific institutions called Magdalen Laundries, which were institutions, the last of which closed in 1996 and was in the middle of Dublin. It was not, you know, on a remote island in the, you know, off, off the, uh, the, the, the Atlantic coast. Um, and these were institutions in which women who were deemed to be in moral danger or posing moral danger to others, usually women who were being abused, um, were, were snatched from their homes and, and locked up, um, often for life, and made, they were enslaved. They were made to work in, in laundries, um, cleaning the dirty laundry of the society, literally. I mean, extraordinary stuff. And, and that, that book is an absolutely beautiful book, um, superbly written. Um, and she does her version of what, as I was saying, Irish writers always try to make it difficult for themselves. So what Claire Keegan does, and one of the great things about reading her is that she writes epics that are 100 pages long. You feel, I don't know how, what her working process is, but it feels like she writes you know, a huge story and then distills and distills and distills it down into this beautiful prose. And it's absolutely mesmerizing and, and, and really important that a book like that, you know, is a huge bestseller in Ireland. You know, it's, a, it's not, it's a, I mean, it's a literary novel, it's a very serious piece of art, but, you know, almost everybody in Ireland's read it. You know, this is, this is the great thing. Um, in relation to, um, sorry, I've forgotten. The SDLP. Sorry, the, yes, the, the United Ireland. Um, uh, the um, St. Augustine, um, in his confession, says that he, uh, as a young man, he prayed to God to make him um, chaste, but not yet. <laughs> and uh, I think most Irish people pray for a united Ireland, but not yet. You know, it's, it's something that we, 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 we think we ought to want. And indeed, we should want it. You know, the partition of Ireland was a, was a tragedy. It, it's what created these two um, very smug, self-satisfied, inward-looking societies. So instead of having to deal with pluralism, you've got Protestants and Catholics, you need to have a pluralistic democracy, you get a sort of Protestant bit and a Catholic bit, and they're both, in, in their own ways, very happy with that and very happy to suppress their minorities. Uh, so partition was a, was a tragedy. I, I would love to, to see the end of it. Uh, and certainly the direction of travel is towards that, I think, you know, the, the United Kingdom to put it mildly, is not a stable political entity um, going forward. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it may well happen. M my terror is we get another Brexit vote. We, we get another, you know, let's have a referendum on United Ireland and then wake up and we find, oh, it's, it's been passed by 50% plus one vote. And what do we do now? <laughs> you know, uh, so the conversation really needs to be very practical about what should happen. How do you recognize the Britishness of people who still have a right to be British? You know, we, we guaranteed in the Good Friday Agreement that, that, that the Britishness, the, uh, that everybody in Northern Ireland, there's a wonderful phrase in the Good Friday Agreement, the peace agreement, everybody has a right to be Irish or British or both as they may so choose. <laughs> you know, it's a wonderful phrase in an international treaty. And that's, that's in perpetuity and should be in perpetuity. We, you, you cannot impose uh, you, you know, a, a, a humiliation on, 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 on a people like that. So how do we do that? What political structures might come out of that? In our own constitution, we changed our constitution in 1998 to say that the aspiration of the Irish people is to unite in harmony and friendship all those who share the territory of the island of Ireland in all the diversity of their identities and traditions. And I think it's a beautiful formulation of not just our, 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 of Ireland, but of what a 21st century idea of, of democratic identity might mean, you know, which is a recognition of, 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 of diversity and its, and its value. So how do we do that at the moment? If you ask uh, people in Ireland, do you want United Ireland? Consistently, polls say about 66% of people say yes, love it. 
and then you put any qualification in, would you pay more tax? No. <laughs> um, would you change the flag? No. Uh, would you change the national anthem? By the way, we have one of the worst national anthems. In, I mean, we have a beautiful musical culture. Uh, we've got this terrible national anthem. I, I mean, I would, I would vote for United Ireland just to change the national anthem. But, <laughs> but people will say, no, no, you know, you couldn't, no, we wouldn't change that. I mean, nothing. So if you put any reality onto it, people say, no, well, no, not really. We don't really want that. So it just shows that people haven't thought it through. And it relates to the question the gentleman asked about language. Because equally, if you ask, and I always cite this, if you ask Irish people, um, should we all be speaking Irish uh, as our main language, 66% uh, will say yes. And then you say, do you speak Irish? No. <laughs> no. I, I, have you gone to Irish classes? Have you done anything about this? No. Um, and the gentleman's absolutely right. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, in terms of Germany, I, I, maybe I used the word country. I should have used the word state. I meant a state. East Germany and West Germany were different states. The United Kingdom is supposedly one state, although it's in quite a state, I suppose. But. Uh, it, but the, the issue about language, so Irish, for example, is a, uh, 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 an official language of the European Union, uh, where a lot of other minority languages on the islands are, are not. Um, but the great lesson, I think, from Ireland in terms of language is that if you want to revive a lost or, or minority language, you should ban it. Because if you look at Catalan, for example, where, where, you know, which was banned, I mean, it's a thriving language. Um, it, Welsh was never quite banned, but it was very much marginalized and Scottish Gaelic. Um, but when Welsh is thriving, <coughs> uh, uh, the, the revival of the Irish language as the, um, the ma main language of the Irish people has been the primary cultural project of the state for a hundred years. <laughs> and <laughs> and the, the, more, the more official it is, the more you say, you know, you should do this. Um, I, I do remember um, the, the joke we used to have when we were, when we were teenagers was that uh, when they still had very uh, heavy censorship of literature in Ireland when I, when I grew up. All the sex scenes in, in all the books were cut out, um, and, and most Irish writers were banned in Ireland. Um, and, but we always say, you know, the, the half jokingly, that the government policy should be all the books that were banned in, in, in English should be published in Irish, especially the filthy ones, you know, <laughs> and then everybody would want to read, want to read Irish. So, uh, yeah, maybe those, those are the, the two things you should do sort of either ban the language or, or, or ban all the good books in, in everything except the, the language, and, and maybe it will revive. Now, at this <laughs> stage, I would normally say to everyone in the audience, go out, rush out, and buy yourself a copy of We Don't Know Ourselves from the bookshop next door. But unfortunately, even before he started talking, they were all sold out, <laughs> sold out yesterday. So uh, you can't do that, but I'm sure you can order it one way uh, or the other. And in the absence of any copies of Finton's book, let's give him a cracking round of applause. Thank you.